record. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Caitlin Clarkson Pereira, and I am the executive director of GVpedia. And today we're here to talk about the fire hose of falsehood, what exactly that term means, and how it impacts gun violence and gun violence prevention. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, we are recording this session, and all guests here are on mute. If you have uh, any questions, you can certainly submit them in the chat, and we will try to get to them, as many of them as we can. So in a moment, I'm going to introduce you to our presenter. But first, just wanted to give you a brief rundown of who we are. GVpedia is a comprehensive resource providing access to our gun study, study database, which is the largest in existence and now includes over 1,700 academic studies. And we also provide access to GVP University, which is a repository of white papers and fact sheets about gun violence. Both of these are easily searchable by subject matter and are an excellent resource for educational and advocacy purposes. And GVP University is also home to the facts about firearms policy initiative. So I am excited to introduce you to Devin Hughes, who's the founder of GVpedia, who's the one who researched and wrote about the fire hose of falsehood in three different documents, a fact sheet, a guide, and a white paper. And all three of these documents were published on our website a couple of weeks ago. So I'm going to turn this over to Devin and we're going to get started. Perfect, thank you so much. Let me go ahead, get my screen so, shared. Yes, perfect. So Devin, can you tell us a little bit about the fire hose of falsehood? What is it? Um, and then also tell us about the, the, the difference between misinformation and uh, disinformation. Thanks so much, and absolutely. First of all, it's great to see everybody here um, to leap right in so we can have plenty of time for question and answers. Um, the Fire Hose of Falsehood is a disinformation campaign and a very specific type of disinformation campaign. Uh, the RAM Corporation actually coined the term as a study of Russian disinformation tactics. And they found that a fire hose of falsehood has the following features. It's high volume and multi-channel, it's rapid, continuous, and repetitive. It lacks commitment to objective reality and lacks commitment to consistency. And when I ran across this, it sounded strikingly familiar. And so after doing a bunch of research, it became clear that the gun lobby and the NRA specifically we're using a fire hose of falsehood type strategy independent from Russia. And this is a term that's, um, or a type of campaign that's been used all across the world, but has come to the US, particularly in the past few decades. In fact, Steve Bannon, um, when talking about the 2016 campaign, he mentioned flooding the zone with shit. And that's, precisely what a fire hose of falsehood is. It's flooding the zone. And before continuing a bit further into going into the NRA's fire hose of falsehood, I want to first make a distinction between misinformation and disinformation, because quite often these are, terms are used interchangeably in the media um, discourse. And there's a distinction there. So misinformation is false information that is spread regardless of somebody's intent to mislead. So for example, if I was going to say that it's supposed to rain today here and it's actually not, uh, there's no intent from me to deceive anybody, but I am passing along inaccurate information there. So that would be misinformation. Now disinformation is misinformation, but with the intent to mislead from the original progenitor. So they put it out there, they know or definitely should know that the material is false and they're putting it out there anyway. And so almost all of what we're going to be discussing today is dealing with disinformation. Thank you, Devin. Can you tell us a little bit about how the gun lobby uses these tactics? Yes, so going through the historical record, 
there's two different um, fire hoses that the gun lobby has been using over the past five to six decades. One regards the Second Amendment, and then the other regards kind of the loose guns make you safer um, standpoint. So first with the Second Amendment. So from 1888 to 1960, there were a couple dozen law review articles that were done on the Second Amendment. And every single one of them found that the Second Amendment was a collective right, meaning it was there for a militia-based service. Somebody serves in the militia, they're protected under the Second Amendment. Um, that was the consensus from the founding on to basically 1960. And it was very uncontroversial. Nobody really challenged it. It's just the way it was. It was kind of an archaic um, piece of the founding documents. However, in 1955, the NRA felt that it would be politically expedient if the Second Amendment referred to an individual right, where basically somebody has the right um, to own firearms and then carry them in public. And the chief of the NRA at that time decided to commission an internal study to figure out whether they could successfully argue that the Second Amendment was an individual right. And the internal study came back and said, absolutely not. <laughs> There's no real evidence for here. Regardless of that, the NRA decided to ignore those findings and start funding research into the Second Amendment. And so from 1970 to 1989, all of a sudden we see this dramatic shift. Whereas before all the law review articles were saying, of course, the Second Amendment's a collective right. Now all of a sudden a majority of the law review articles were claiming that the Second Amendment referred to an individual right. And this was um, done by just a handful of scholars that were heavily funded by the NRA, like millions of dollars were poured into these law review articles to shift the consensus. And it overwhelmed the few scholars that had actually been studying the Second Amendment before. And this campaign bore fruit in 2008 in the DC versus Heller case where the Supreme Court sided with the individual rights interpretation of the Second Amendment and then again this year in the New York um, case versus Bruin. And it took the Second Amendment even further from having claiming to have the right to protect, um, have a firearm in the home to being able to carry a gun outside the home as well. And also through a very weird rationale about following history, but that's a subject for another time. But suffice it to say, basically from 1960 to present day, the NRA was able to turn something that just wasn't even thought of politically to a political reality now. So it was incredibly successful for a relatively cheap investment. The NRA has done something quite similar with the Guns Make You Safer fire hose, starting in the 80s and 90s. And what they did in a general process was they started suppressing accurate research from the CDC, where they basically chopped the CDC's budget by the amount that was being dedicated to gun violence and suggested if you start keep studying gun violence, more of your funding is going to leave. And in so doing, that greatly chilled the academic environment and allowed the NRA to then tout discredited research by just a handful of academics again, such as John Lott and Gary Kleck, and put out those findings. And there is very little to counter them. There is still research ongoing, but the playing field was basically leveled by the NRA by suppressing accurate research. And the NRA knows it's doing that. Um, so they touted discredited research, suppressed accurate research, and this created a whole host of confusion among 
the mainstream because now it looks like there's both sides to an argument that have research and it's going to be difficult to determine who to actually believe. And this has had major repercussions um, for the general public, where you now have 63% of Americans believing that a firearm makes them safer, which is dramatically up from the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. And one of the ways we can see this, and I'll explain the chart in a moment, is how advertisement has occurred over the past multiple decades. Back in the 1950s and 60s, um, in Guns Magazine and even the NRA Magazine, the overwhelming themes were about hunting and sports. So you'd see your standard old hunting rifles, shotguns, and everything was focused around that sportsman type culture. But then a shift started happening in the 80s and particularly in the 90s, where self-defense and concealed carry became the massive themes in advertising as the NRA and other gun groups realized that this was a far more lucrative market and trying to convince people that they needed a gun in the home for self-defense and to carry it outside the home for self-defense as well. And so this chart comes from an academic study that analyzes these trends. The red and blue lines represent the proportion of ads that are on the hunting and sports shootings topic, whereas the yellow and green lines represent the self-defense and concealed carry themes. As we can see, it wasn't until like the 2000s where the lines intersected and started going to where self-defense concealed carry had a major advantage. But the major spike occurred in 1995, 1996. Well, what happened in 1995, 1996? Well, there is a study by John Lott that was turned into a book, More Guns, Less Crime. And so while it's not really possible to prove a causal relationship there, the timing's definitely suspicious. And regardless of whether John Lott's work caused much of this shift, because the shift was occurring slightly before as well, um, it definitely provided a lot of material for the NRA to work with. And we've seen that happen over the past several decades. And the NRA knows exactly what it's doing here. This is not by accident. And there's even an internal document from 2021 that was um, published by the Trace where it shows them talking about this strategy in rather explicit terms. While these laws are intended to prevent the creation of firearm registries, this also prevents research, researchers from conducting accurate studies with the number and distribution of firearms as a variable. So they're talking about how their policies explicitly make it hard or close to impossible to conduct accurate research. And he goes on further to talk about how this is why no matter the policy, our messaging continues to focus on self-defense. There's some evidence that the NRA's work to expand right to carry laws in the 90s and early 2000s helped drive public support for self-defense with a firearm. And so what are the two themes there? Defensive gun use and more guns, less crime, basically. And that's the cent centerpiece of the NRA's messaging here in this specific fire hose of falsehood. Can you tell us a little more about the particular strengths of a fire hose of falsehood and in particular what can make it so dangerous? Yeah, so the reason the NRA has been using a fire hose of falsehood is that it works and it works quite successfully when not countered properly. And a large portion of this is that disinformation itself has large advantages over accurate information. So some of these include just the ability to come up with disinformation far quicker than accurate information. To come up with accurate information, you need to do research, fact checking, double checking, triple checking to make sure things are accurate. And then publishing those results after months, years, decades even. Whereas for disinformation, you can just make it up on the spur of the moment, cobble together some stuff that looks like evidence and push it out there in the space of a couple hours. 
and you have put out information and are running in front of accurate information. Disinformation also tends to be um, memorable and have greater emotional appeal because you can design disinformation to have those sort of appeals. Whereas reality tends to be nuanced and messy, you can put forward a very clean narrative using disinformation because you can control every aspect of it. And so when you combine that sort of appeal ability to get it out there quickly, you find that disinformation is shared far more on social media and can heavily outcirculate accurate information. And so it's really tough to counter. The other problem is that it's an asymmetric battle. So there can be the sort of feeling that, well, if the other side's playing fast and loose with <laughs> facts, well, why can't we just to keep up with them? And that doesn't work because whenever you do that and people catch on, people become apathetic. They figure out that, oh, both sides are lying to me. And then they leave the political discussion there. And that creates a problem because typically the people running a fire hose of falsehood campaign, they're not wanting to make progress on an issue. They don't want more people coming into the political debate. And so if people turn apathetic or disillusioned, that's a win for the fire hose of falsehood. So the only way to really match a fire hose of falsehood is with accurate and factual information. And facts really do matter here. So can you tell us the best ways to push back against a fire hose of falsehood and what we can do specifically in the movement? Yes, yeah, so there's two main components of how to counter a fire hose of falsehood. One at the strategic level, so something organizations can do, then at the personal level, which all of us individually can do. So one of the key things to counter a fire hose of falsehood is to create a fire hose of truth, as it were. You need to be able to match the breadth and scope of the fire hose of falsehood. If you let some of the fire hose basically leak into the discourse, um, it's going to quickly become unmanageable. So whenever falsehoods are being pushed out there, factual information needs to be pushed out there just as much, um, making sure to match basically everything the other side is putting out there to make sure that at the very least, people are hearing factual information whenever they're hearing the disinformation from the other side. One of the biggest parts of the research on persuasion is showing the effectiveness of what's called inoculation campaigns. And these um, inoculation campaigns treat disinformation like a virus and accurate information like a vaccine. And so what they do in these experiments, and it works in practice as well, is they show people what the inaccurate information that they're likely to encounter is going to be. And this has done, been done particularly with um, global warming topics. So those sh share some piece of disinformation that basically the energy industry is probably putting out there um, that indicates that global warming is a hoax. And then they'll explain in detail why that's inaccurate and what the accurate information is. And what this research finds is that if you only put out the accurate information um, and the other side puts out disinformation, they basically cancel each other out. So you're not going to see people's minds being swayed, except for the people who are more likely to believe in the disinformation, in which case they're going to become more likely to believe the disinformation when you just have the accurate information and disinformation. However, when you attempt to inoculate people from this by presenting them preemptively with, here's the inaccurate information you're likely to encounter, and then people actually encounter that in disinformation, the original accurate message strongly prevails with that strategy. So what all this shows is simply ignoring the other side's talking points cannot work. At best, you're going to maintain a status quo with that and likely lose ground. You have to confront what the other side's saying 
head on and explain why it's inaccurate to build up basically immunity to the disinformation. Another key finding from the research is showing the effectiveness of deep canvassing. So traditional political canvassing often involves going up, knocking on the door and telling people, here's why you should support X, Y, and Z. And then basically checking that name off the list and going to the next door. The difference with deep canvassing is, is that it's engaging the person in more of a conversation where the canvasser actually shows interest in what the person they're talking to um, thinks on the subject and having them explain why they believe certain things about the topic they're canvassing on. And then asking the person to relate to the people, whether it's on immigration or transgender rights or um, guns, as it were, um, having people relate to the victims and people impacted um, greatly increases the chance that these people are going to change their minds and then support. And the key here is that traditional canvassing techniques research shows have a, an average effect of zero. They don't sway anybody for a long term, whereas deep canvassing is the only technique that has been shown to do so. And Vox with a V um, has a great article on deep canvassing techniques in general that goes into depth and our research goes into depth about how to do this as well. Another key here is to focus on at-risk populations. So basically finding the people that the fire hose of falsehood is being most directed at and then going directly into those communities and trying to inoculate them from the disinformation. Um, just trying to debate the NRA one-on-one, -on -one. while it's key to make sure you're matching the breadth and scope of the fire hose, fire hose the most in-depth measures really need to be targeted and focused. And then the final aspect is uh, what not to do. And you want to avoid censorship. So while it's tempting to just um, cancel the other side or refuse to discuss or debate with them, um, that tends to backfire because what research shows is people are like, oh, you're trying to hide the, tr the truth from us by trying to suppress this disinformation. And so what the research really shows is that you, ha you have to engage. Now you have to engage smartly, just randomly going on to Twitter and fighting with every pro-gun person on there, that's not going to achieve anything. But making sure that the other side's not going unchallenged and having those in-depth conversations is key and not trying to suppress the other side. Sunlight works far better than suppression here. So making sure that people are aware of, here's the falsehoods you're likely to encounter and here's how best to counter them works far more effectively than just trying to prevent people from encountering the disinformation in the first place. So at the, that's at the strategic level. At the personal level, the research indicates that there's almost a four stage process to persuasion. The first stage is making sure you're circumventing tribal barriers and establishing trust. Like just encountering somebody randomly on the street or online and trying to convince them, it's almost never going to work. There has to be some level of trust there. Um, trust is most effectively built by people who have been directly impacted by gun violence, so survivors. Um, also people who used to be on the pro-gun side, but have since legitimately changed their mind on the topic. So gun owners who want responsible gun laws, for example, are very successful at persuading people. And then if you're neither a survivor or somebody who used to be pro-gun, um, just establishing some form of commonality, like, hey, we're both parents here and concerned about the welfare of our children. Making sure that you're seen as part of a similar tribe, even if it's not in something directly re related to gun violence, can help build that trust. Once that trust is built, built then the next stage is listening. 
so not just trying to bombard people with facts as I'm sometimes <laughs> guilty of, and like, here's a dozen fact sheets, but instead listening to the other person explain why they believe what they do, having them explain in detail how they think various gun laws work, and just listening to see like what their core values are when coming to this. And that provides a number of advantages. First, it tells you where their value system is and what's most important to them. If they're most concerned about safety, well, then you're, you're going to have an opening there to talk about how guns actually don't make you safer and put forward a narrative that doesn't challenge their overarching value system, but aligns with it. Um, listening to somebody also lets them feel heard, which most people in the end, that's basically what they want. They just want to be heard and respected to some degree. And then by forcing or having somebody explain, it reveals the illusion of explanatory depth. Most people think they know a whole lot more about an issue than they actually do. As it turns out, their opinion on something might have been framed or formed by an article they read like a decade ago and nothing else. And having somebody explain why they believe what they do, it reveals that illusion to themselves and they realize that, oh, I probably actually don't know as much about this as I thought I did and I'm open to learning more. And also research finds that when people explain why they believe what they do, um, they become more moderate in their beliefs. And so it moves the discussion to where somebody is going to be open to facts. And that's where stage three comes in. And that's building a fact-based foundation where you can use the inoculation and deep canvassing type strategies to provide people with the necessary facts and figures that align that still align with their core values. So that way they don't have to change or alter who they are. They can still be a conservative Republican who's voted for Trump twice, maybe three or four times to prove voter fraud or whatever. <laughs> but they can believe that stronger gun laws don't challenge their core conservative values, but in fact, perfectly align with them. And so getting somebody to that fact-based foundation, while you're not going to convert everything they believe overnight, you can move them on a single issue quite substantially. And then the final action, once somebody's already on your side, as it were, is motivating the person to action. And here, you don't want to go with facts, figures, or even multiple stories, but a single emotional narrative tends to produce um, the most willingness to take further action, to increase donations, and so forth. Just a single story, not clouding things with facts and figures here. And so while facts do matter, they matter in a, precise, in a precise fashion. A single story matters, but a certain place. So making sure basically things are in, in alignment in the persuasion process can be very helpful in convincing somebody. And so to summarize things, the, the problem is the fire hose of falsehood, which is, again, high volume and multi-channel, rapid, continuous, and repetitive, lacks objective commitment to reality, and consistency. So that's what we're up against. And the best solution, according to the academic research from multiple disciplines, is creating our own fire hose of truth at the strategic level using inoculation and deep canvassing strategies focusing at at-risk populations, avoiding censorship. At the personal level, making sure we circumvent tribal barriers and build personal bonds and trust with people who disagree with us, exploring their beliefs and core values, listening attentively to them, attentively to them and respecting their positions, even if we disagree with them, building a fact-based foundation and moving the person to action. So before opening things up to questions, just a brief plug. Um, we have an article that appeared in the Hill on Sunday, countering the gun lobby's fire hose of falsehood. So you can read that and sharing it's much appreciated. And then we have the research
on our own page, which um, you can find under GVP University that has a fact sheet, white paper, and guide to it at varying lengths. So thank you all, and I'm open to any and all questions. Thank you, Devin. Uh, I'm going to give people a minute to see if they have any to put in the chat, but I also have one here that we received in our RSVP. Hold on one second. Uh, also, everyone, I'm not sure if you noticed, but in the chat, I put a link to that Hill op-ed that Devin had published on Sunday. Uh, so the question I have here is, my understanding is that the Second Amendment was created because the founders did not want a standing army. Since we have had a standing army for over 100 years, doesn't that make 2A obsolete, obsolete and should it be replaced? Um. Uh, I'll slightly dodge the should it be replaced given how high the political hurdles are there um, requiring a large majority of states and Congress. And given that more than half states have permitless carry already, that would be a multi-decade struggle. And GVPD is a 501c3. So that gets into the more political question. But in terms of the historical record, um, absolutely. The Second Amendment as written was meant for militias because the founding fathers did not want a standing army because they feared that could result in tyranny. Now times change. People quickly realize that militias suck, <laughs> as it were, for defense and that um, a more regular military force was better. And also there's a relatively unknown law passed in the early 1900s that separated out the militia into the untrained and unregulated militia, which were kind of all a part of in a way. Um, and then you have the trained militia, which is the National Guard. And when you look at the actual text of the Second Amendment, where it's talking about well-regulated well militia, that was codified as the National Guard. So basically, the federal government cannot prevent states from managing the National Guard. That's the actual intent of the Second Amendment. And even when you look at the language of to keep and bear arms, there is a historical linguistic analysis that looked at that text and found that more than 90% of references to bearing arms back in the 1700s um, was in relation to military service. This, the Supreme Court ignored that both in 2008 and 2022 and basically rewrote the Second Amendment. So now we do have an individual rights interpretation that is codified. And I personally think that we should treat the decisions as egregiously wrong as written. Basically what the right wing did with um, overturning Roe versus Wade and putting in place a decades long strategy to get back to the original meaning of the second amendment one that's based on historical text analysis. But it's going to be a decades long struggle there. And, but in the meantime, even with the right wing courts, very radical interpretation, there's still plenty of room for gun laws and legislation. Now, of course, <laughs> in a decade's time or so, um, Clarence Thomas and others might decide that the Second Amendment is absolute and anybody can own anything whenever. But as it currently stands, there's still room for reasonable gun regulations and making sure those are passed is going to be critical to saving lives. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions here in the chat. The first one is you mentioned 
that this discredited the research. In case someone were to cite that while speaking to us, can you tell us why the research was discredited and what the specific problems were with it? Um, so that's the topic of four, four or five different uh, presentations. And if you go to um, GVpedia's YouTube channel, you'll find um, a number of videos on the various falsehoods and discredited research. And if you also look at GVpedia's website and our uh, facts about firearms policy initiative, you'll find a bunch of those myths and why they're discredited. A couple of the main ones I referenced here were from Gary Kleck and John Lott. Gary Kleck is most known for his work on defensive gun use, indicating that there's 2.5 million defensive gun uses each year. Um, that's wildly inaccurate and based on survey data has, that has major flaws. Um, we go into that in much more depth on GVPD and we have fact sheets, videos on the defensive gun use myth. Suffice it to say, there's about 2,000 verified defensive gun uses, which is a far cry from 2.5 million. And then the other is from John Lott, his work on more guns, less crime, gun-free zones, and the idea that gun laws in general don't work. And each of those is worthy of like multiple lectures alone but I'd highly recommend using our facts about firearm policy initiative, emailing us if something specific comes up and we're more than happy to provide the detailed information on each of those myths and why they are myths and how best to counter them. Devin, how has social media accelerated this information? And can social media be used to counter without getting mirrored in social media's muck? <laughs> um, so social media has greatly accelerated the power of disinformation. So I, I wanna avoid saying that social media is entirely at fault. Like you can go back to the invention of the printing press way back in the 1400s <laughs> and find people bemoaning like, oh, this newfangled technology that allows people to print books. It just lets disinformation fly everywhere and how could it? And during that period of time, like the printing press from like a disinformation perspective was a catastrophe. Like major wars were fought because of the printing pre <laughs> press. But over time, it turned out to be like one of the best inventions ever because it also allowed accurate information to get out there, but it certainly accelerated disinformation. And we're seeing the same thing again with social media where disinformation can be shared like five, six, even like 10 times more frequently than accurate information because it has that emotional appeal that can be perfectly tailored. Social media can be used um, to help counter the fire hose of falsehood because it's an important aspect of matching the breadth of the fire hose. So making sure disinformation doesn't go unchallenged, but recognizing that social media is one of the last places that you're going to be able to convince somebody of, anybody, of anything. Like when you're responding to somebody on social media, like, you're not going to be convincing the person who just pulled out like lots mean that 96% of mass shootings occur in gun-free zones. You're not going to convince that person via Twitter. However, there's other people viewing that tweet that might be on the fence. And if that goes unchallenged, they might think that, oh, that's actually accurate information. I'm going to change my mind on this. Um, where the real work of persuasion occurs though is in person and building those personal connections with people who disagree with us, maybe on everything, but finding an opening where like, hey, there's an opportunity here for accurate information to be provided and figuring out why people believe what they do, making sure that they're heard and listened to and respected all that's much easier to do in person than just 
slinging insults over Twitter or Facebook or whatever the kids these days are using in terms of social media. So an important point here and something that we talk about um, occasionally is I think people can relate to comparing the NRA with the tobacco lobby's disinformation campaign. Only drawback is that younger people may not be as familiar with this. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I do think that the tobacco campaign is a very good analogy. Uh, I mean, all analogies aren't perfect by their nature being analogies, but treating um, smokers as victims rather than sort of a how dare you with that disgusting habit, you're a horrible person, please go lock yourself in a room and choke on your own smoking or whatever. Like that's not going to convince somebody to be like, you know, you're right, I should really stop smoking. Instead showing that like, hey, you got taken advantage of by this corporate campaign to sell you more cigarettes that are destroying your health. And here's solutions to help get out of that. And one of the key things with the entire tobacco lobby and bringing them down was that the research came first and it took a while for that research to win out over the tobacco lobby's um, own so-called research. Like that took decades. And once it was firmly established that like, hey, smoking causes cancer as well as all these other hor horrific health problems, only then could the discussion start moving towards public health and safety laws where rather than having people smoke on planes and have the entire interior be gray, um, you can no longer smoke on planes and it greatly reduced smoking in public. And that was a very important victory, but the research came first, the facts came first, and then came the hard work of convincing people. Right now, even though the research is clearly there that guns do not make us safer and stronger gun laws save lives, it's not widely accepted yet. A majority of people still think that firearms make them safer. And it's going to be very hard to switch or to change public attitudes, to get them to support stronger gun laws if they think that those laws are actually going to be making them less safe by preventing them from protecting themselves. We have to win that narrative first almost in order to make larger progress. Now, we can do multiple things at once. We can still push forwards stronger laws, try to halt laws make, or laws that make things worse like permitless carry while winning the fact-based war, but we have to win the fact-based war before substantial progress is going to be made on a nationwide basis. Devin, this is a two-part question. First is, what percent of U.S. homes have firearms? And is it true that 3% of U.S. gun owners hold half of all civilian firearms in the United States? Uh, it's 30-something percent. Like, there's multiple surveys out there that show between 30 and 40 percent, and it also varies versus household versus like people who actually own the guns themselves. Um, gun ownership actually used to be higher like in the 60s, 70s and 80s, but then fell during the 90s, but gun ownership became much more concentrated during that time. So you had people buying multiple guns where you'll have like one person owning like a hundred different guns. Like there've been caches of thousands of guns that some people have had. And so I forget what the precise percentages are, but I, I think it's around like 10 percent, like 10 to 20 percent of gun owners own like 80 percent of firearms. And that's rather standard across industries, actually, to where like 20 percent of the customer base tends to be 80 percent of the business. Um, so it's not terribly surprising there but gun ownership has definitely become far more concentrated. Um, so in general strokes, that's accurate. 
So this is something that one of our participants has heard before and wants to know if you've read this as well and what you think about it. So I've read that the real reason for the inclusion of the Second Amendment in the Bill of Rights was Virginia Governor Patrick Henry's opposition to the new constitution, which had a provision that would take power over state militia from the states and give it to the federal government. Henry was a major slaveholder who wanted to use the militia to protect his investment and enforce slavery. Have you read this? And if so, what do you think of it? Yes, um, I think that's certainly part of the reasoning where you had a bunch of states, particularly the Southern states, far more distrustful of central authority where you could have the national government that say that, oh, we want all the militias to go fight Canada or something it, at the moment where there's massive um, slave uprisings and rebellions to like <laughs> get their freedom. And the Southern states wanted to have the militia on hand to make sure they had some protection on that. So I think that's certainly part of the justification. I wouldn't go as far to say that's all of it because you did have Northern states like Vermont and others that had versions of the second amendment written into their own state constitutions, um, even before the national constitution was formed. So um, you definitely did have like a civic militia based sort of uh, mentality, even in the Northern freer states um, that would go along with it. But it was far more like states versus federal government than wanting to make sure that every person could have a gun. And back then, like having the firearm was seen as like a civic duty to where you keep it maintained and such, and then you show up for muster. And you even had early firearm registries here where if you didn't have your musket properly maintained, you would get in trouble because you're damaging the security of um, basically all the people in your town. And like the, there is like a couple attempts in the early 1800s for an individual right. And there's like one particular case in Kentucky where a court ruled that their state constitution constituted an individual right. And its language was far more specific for every man should be able to carry a weapon for defense of the state and himself. So it had more personal language written in and the court decided like, hey, this is an individual right to carry. And the state legislator is, legislature is like, what are you doing? This was not our intent whatsoever. We're going to revise this quickly. And so they actually rewrote their constitution to make sure that, no, no, this is not an individual right. They even have a court case in Arkansas a bit later that referenced that same Kentucky case it was, was basically like, can you imagine what idiots you would be to have people carrying firearms concealed on their person? Like nobody would ever do such a thing. And so you have this really strident language where they're basically insulting, like actual judges are insulting the intelligence of anybody at that time who would think having guns promulgate at a personal level would be a good idea. And so you just, have this really amusing historical record where people are like, absolutely not. And that was the consensus for more than a century until the NRA decided that it was more profitable for the Second Amendment to be an individual right. Um, someone made a point to state that maybe the problem now versus back when tobacco research was being taken more seriously is that people don't really trust things that they hear the way they used to, right? We have, question, we have questions about science that we never would have imagined coming to the forefront before. So maybe that's part of it as well. I mean, yes and no, like the social media definitely makes weird opinions like out in front more. But I mean, back in the 
like early email days, you would have the chain emails where it's like, um, did you know that Hillary Clinton consorted with um, aliens and had a bat baby with them or something? Like the, the stuff that would be on these email chains and from these fringe websites would be absolutely insane. And my guess is a decent portion of the population probably believe that. Like the anti-vaccine movement has been around for quite a long time. And now social media may it far easier for people who believe in those sort of conspiracies and falsehoods to find each other and connect, connect and bond over that sort of stuff. But I do think those opinions and disinformation has been around for a long time, like even back to the printing press days and before, like it's, there's always been that in society. It's just, more pronounced or obvious now. And now that being said, I do agree that um, like there is a general lack of trust and authority now, particularly after um, COVID where you had public health messaging that just did not turn out all that well and various contradictions contradictions where it's like first you don't want masks then you absolutely need masks and then like whether it's outside or inside there's all sort of confusing muddle there and so you did have major messaging pro problems there that did exacerbate exacerbate trust in authorities and that's been going on for a while as well but yeah that it definitely is a challenge and the solution to that is like when you build trust with somebody at a personal level to slowly work on that and see like why they believe what they do and then figure out where the holes are, where their values are um, and work with that. And it's probably not going to be just one conversation um, it can be multiple conversations over weeks or months, slowly chipping away. Like I still have um, friends and relatives who are very much major Trump supporters, um, but they largely agree with me on firearms policy because I've spent months, years talking with them on this. And I have that element of trust because they were already existing friends and family. and just building that over time to where like, yes, they would likely vote for Trump a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth time <laughs> or so. But on guns, their position is shifted, even if they are even NRA members. Just one final question in the last two or so minutes that we have here. You talk about the gun for safety propaganda from the NRA and it's racial implications. Yeah, so that's a multifaceted um, portion. So you definitely have like the NRA seizing on fears, particularly around 2020, where you had the George Floyd protests and reckoning there and the NRA being able to take that and like, look, the inner cities are burning and they're all coming for you. Antifa is around every corner. Um, go get guns to protect yourself from that. Like they definitely did heavily lean into that um, earlier. Like when there's ISIS, like there is an NRA magazine thing where it showed like one of the ISIS guys with a knife and it's like, he could be in your neighborhood, um, like get guns. Um, in the 90s as well, like there's definitely when you had protests and such in LA, um, the NRA would seize on that. Um, but more recently, the NRA is definitely going into minority communities and kind of playing the other side as well to where it's like, oh, look, the police can no longer protect you in these communities like you need a gun to protect yourself because you can re you can't rely on anybody else and look at all the government and structures that are aligned against you you need a firearm there and so they're leaning into that as well because they recognize that that's a new and emerging customer base that's 
um, going to be quite profitable for them as well. So we need to be aware of that and cognizant that the NRA is not just doing the whole like good old boy from Alabama or Mississippi um, sort of redneck. <laughs> like that's no longer like, like they've already captured that customer base and they're looking to expand. And one of those areas is various minority communities and trying to get them to buy as many guns as possible. Fantastic. Thank you for answering all those questions and for explaining the fire hose to false, fire hose of falsehood to us. Um, it's about two o'clock, so um, we're going to let everybody go. We want to be respectful of your time, but we are recording this. So I will get an email out on um, the next day or two with a link to this, and you can pass it along to anybody who you think would like to watch it. And we know that this topic has a lot of layers to it, and um, while it's a little bit complicated, it's also really important to understand. So if there are any organizations that are looking for Devin to speak more one-on-one, -on -one, or if you have specific questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'll put my email address right here in the chat, just for anybody who doesn't have it. And we can certainly try to coordinate that if that would be helpful for you. All right, thanks everyone for coming and thank you so much, Devin. Good job. Thank you, Thank great you so work. Much.